Well, thank you for coming for the second part. Uh, so uh, we'll basically stop. Actually, we will continue where we stopped the last time. Uh, so if you remember, uh, last time we were explaining about regulatory loops, about cooperativity, and, uh, and about the last three. So uh, this all goes by regulation. Uh, and then uh, regulation is actually relating your input, for example, uh, your concentration of ligand, with your output. For example, uh, in our example, it was uh, binding occupancy of the receptor. Uh, but now, what happens if input changes with time? For, for example, uh, let us say that we have our transcription factor. So one of these examples was transcription factor, which is binding to DNA and then regulating transcription. Uh, but then concentration of transcription factor can, can increase. And if this happens, then what will happen is that output with, will, will also change with time. So by changing input with time, you will also change the output with time. And then uh, this is called regulatory dynamics. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, in biology, you have a really very nice example of a system which is inherently dynamical, which cannot even, in, in the first approximation, be treated. Well, it, it cannot be treated at all as an equilibrium system. And these are biological oscillators, uh, for example, circadian rhythms. Uh, so if you have flown by aeroplane to this meeting or somewhere else, you might have noted that you have some problems to adjust uh, to a new time zone. And this is actually temporary dis dysregulation of a circadian clock. So what circadian clock does is that it takes, uh, it takes note about the change of day and night inside, inside our body. Uh, and if you have oscillator, it will not have stationary state at all. So it will, uh, all the time it will just, the concentration, for example, will, will change with time. Uh, so the dynamics is, is really very important when it comes to bi biology systems and, and when it comes to its regulation. Okay, uh, and now uh, I'll just remind you uh, from the last lecture. So uh, I'm going back to this input because we will use it uh, in this lecture again. Uh, and as a matter of fact, so uh, this is the, the most simple case when you have just uh, one molecule, just one ligand binding to receptor. And then uh, in the lecture number three, we will be seeing more complex cases of regulation where you have, for example, multiple proteins coming together, interacting with themselves, interacting with DNA. We will see a very nice uh, very, and simple, actually, formalism to, uh, to account for that. But then, uh, so uh, what we were showing last time, uh, what was important for us was this sigmoidal curve. So this is binding probability uh, of a, a receptor to be bound by ligand. So if you have just uh, one, uh, if you have just one ligand binding to the receptor, then this end will be one, and you will have this sigmoidal curve. We will use it. Uh, now, uh, actually, this is also an exercise for you. Uh, and it goes back to, to Julia's question, so I thought it would be a good exercise in, I guess, elementary calculus. Uh, so uh, you can try to, to take a derivative of this binding probability and calculate it at A equals to KD. Uh, so a, a equals to KD is this uh, sort of transition point where, where you have half occupancy of the receptor. So the result that you get is that this derivative is N, N is cooperativity, and then you have, it's directly proportional to N and inversely proportional to the dis dissociation constant. So like in this figure, if you have that your dissociation constant is, uh, is the same, uh, then what happens is that this derivative calculated at this point is just 10 with some prefactor, which does not, not matter. So in other words, if you have larger cooperativity, then indeed, as you can see, you have larger and larger slope at this point, meaning that the system is making more and more rapid transition from off to on state. And this is really like uh, one of the basic self-assumed uh, results in systems biology. A large cooperativity in protein binding leads to switch-like response of the system. Now, uh, what is also a good ex exercise for you, so the question last time was, you know, you, we look at myoglobin and we look at hemoglobin, and if it is not at the log scale, what you can see here is that, uh, you know, it appears that myoglobin, not, not that it appears, but it does, myoglobin is increasing uh, more rapidly than hemoglobin does. So if it is, this is without the log scale, 
And then again, going to this derivative, you know, at, at this, at this KD point, uh, it is proportional to N, but then inversely proportional to KD. And now if you compare myoglobin to hemoglobin, myoglobin actually has a much smaller dissociation constant. So you can see it is on the order of, uh, well, whatever, it is one in these strange units, it does not matter. And hemoglobin has dissociation constant which is order of magnitude larger. So it is actually due to this. So for hemoglobin, N is larger. N is, say, four or three if you actually did that exercise that I gave you yesterday. But then KD uh, is actually significantly larger for an order of magnitude for hemoglobin than myoglobin. So it is this effect of KD which appears as myoglobin is, is initially increasing more rapidly. So this is nice exercise. I mean, elementary, but, but reasonable exercise for you to do to make these derivatives. But then uh, the question is why it looks differently on the log scale, right? So on the log scale, you do see, right, this uh, switch-like behavior for, uh, for hemoglobin. It, it, it rapidly, indeed, here makes transition from off to on state. And actually, here it is on the log scale. So you are making derivative of d log p with respect to d log a. And then it's, it's also easy to show that uh, then, then actually kd drops out, and you have just 10 here. So uh, essentially, uh, on the log scale, what happens is that you effectively eliminate KD, and you e isolate just the effect, the effect of differences in comparativity, and which we want to do, actually. So uh, the question that we are asking is, what makes it different when we have cooperative binding uh, of, of our lingots? OK. Uh, Okay, so just keep in mind this input to output and, and well, try to do uh, this exercise. And, and there is also one more point that I want to make here. So if something is not, uh, is not clear from the plots or from the numerics, it's, it's really very useful when you can do that uh, just to analytically derive things uh, to better understand how it works. Unfortunately, in reality, very often this is not possible in systems biology because our systems are inherently highly nonlinear. Uh, so very often, uh, if, you, if you approximate them or simplify them, you will lose the effect itself. For example, like bistability, oscillations. These are really highly nonlinear. And without nonlinearity, these effects do not even exist. So uh, not very often you can do like, well, uh, numerical derivation like that. OK. Uh, OK, uh, now uh, we go back to the dynamics. So we have our input. And then uh, let me say that this, this concentration of A changes with time. Uh, now uh, what happens is that we will have some reactants. So these are C. And we will have some reactions. And the reactions are defined by these reaction rates. Uh, and so what will happen is that uh, reactants will change by time. So uh, this change is given by, by these first derivatives. And then this change, it in general depends on the, on the concentration of other reactants. And, and it, it depends on the rates of chemical reactions. So it seems simple, right? So uh, we can basically uh, write this. It's first order, I'm sorry, it's first order in general nonlinear non differential equation. We can solve it, at least on computer, integrate it, and we know how, how our system evolves with time. But now, uh, what is sort of really hard, hard part, as at, at least at, at in the beginning, is how to find this function f. And this is what I will go step by step. So for different kinds of reactions, I will show you how we find this f, how we find uh, in what way the concentrations uh, in the set of biochemical reactions change. OK, so uh, the most simple uh, case is if we have just degradation of the molecules. So we have molecules, and then they degrade with rate k. So uh, every molecule has the same probability to be degraded. So therefore, the rate of change will be just the rate of degradation times the concentration. There is minus sign, of course, because uh, it is degradation. So the concentration of molecules is going down. And uh, you can just, so another thing that you can analytically divide, derive, you just separate the variables, and uh, you get the exponential decay. So if you start with some concentration uh, of your molecules in the beginning, then on a time scale which is, uh, which is uh, determined by this 1 over k, about half of your molecules will, will go down. Actually, the half time will be a log of 2 divided by k, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. 
uh, okay, but uh, what I want you that you remember, uh, always we have decay in biochemical reactions. So decay can be active. For example, if it is protein, protein, protease can come and it can eat the protein. If it is RNA, then RNA, RNA ases. So they, these are enzymes which degrade, degrade RNA. They will, they will de degrade or decay RNA. Uh, but also in the case of proteins, so I, I told you that uh, in messenger RNA, it is on, on the order of magnitude of uh, minutes. Typically, why for the proteins? Uh, they can be very, very stable, so uh, their degradation rates can be on, on the order of hours. But even if in such cases, if, if something like this happens, let me say that we have absolutely stable protein, uh, and say that we have this protein in, in bacteria, and that bacteria is dividing. Can you tell me, uh, will we have effective degradation of this protein still? So it's not actively degrading at all, but... Uh, you have bacteria which is dividing. So what will be its effective degradation rate? It will be determined by what? Well, you have one bacteria, and then after one bacterial division, you got two bacteria. So effectively, the volume is increased by two. So essentially, uh, what will happen is that concentration of your protein inside bacterial cell will be diluted twice by each division of the bacteria. So even if, for example, your protein is absolutely stable, then its half-life will, will be determined by the, by the rate of the division or the division time of the, of the bacteria. So uh, basically my point is that everything has to, to degrade. So uh, essentially, uh, in every case, you will have this degradation term in your reactions. Uh -huh. Exactly, right, right. Yeah, we will come to that. So, so this is a very good point. So uh, this is degradation without the help of enzymes. And now, if we would have uh, help of enzymes, then actually there, this would not be really a linear relationship here. It would be nonlinear. It would be michaelis menten law. And I will come to that uh, very soon. So actually, even if you have enzyme, uh, if it happens that your uh, substrate concentration is much less than michaelis menten constant, then you can approximate it by this linear relationship. But, but I'll come back, back to that soon. Uh, okay, uh, now our next thing, uh, also simple, is reversible reaction. So you have A going to B and then B going back to, to A. So this uh, forward rate is K plus, this reverse rate is K minus. And now uh, how do we write the change of, of, of A with time? So this is this derivative, dCA by dt. Uh, so uh, we have the forward rate, which means that A goes to B, so meaning that A is being lost, and it is lost with the rate K plus times CA. So this is this forward reaction. But then also uh, we get A. We get A from B, and this is this reverse reaction, and then the rate of reverse reaction is K minus multiplied by, by the concentration of B. Uh, so uh, here we uh, wrote the change of A, with time, and uh, what do you think? If, if we write the change of B with time, what kind of equation we will get? Actually, so it's already written, but just, right, it's it just, just with the minus sign, and it looks trivial, uh, but actually, uh, this is another important uh, point, so this is so-called one example of conservation in biochemical reactions. So this sort of conservation law, laws can be helpful, because it, uh, they allow you to uh, Instead of having differential equation, you have just an algebraic expression. And then it's more easy to integrate your system. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and here, of course, you know, the conservation law is that concentration of A plus concentration of B has to be constant. So this is what you get if you get this on the left-hand side of the equation. Because A goes to B and B goes back to A, so concentration of A plus B has to be, uh, has to be constant. Again, here it, it, it looks trivial, but there are... Uh, sort of uh, less trivial uh, and more useful. Actually, this is useful as well, but, but there are less trivial conservation laws which, which you can usefully use when you are when you're working on your system. Okay, and now uh, we come to bimolecular reaction. So uh, we have A which, uh, which reacts with B and then it, it makes a complex AB. Uh, so uh, the rate of this reaction is, uh, corresponds to the product of A and B concentrations. Well, simply you have A and B which are wiggling around and then they have to find each other in order to react. And probability to find each other is proportional to their concentrations. Uh, okay. 
Now, uh, let me go back uh, to our initial thing. So this is ligand, which is binding to the receptor. And if you remember yesterday and what I, what I reviewed uh, here in the, in the beginning of the lecture, uh, is that uh, so uh, ligand binding to re receptor is making this, this complex. <coughs> and in the last lecture, we treated this as an equilibrium. So you wait some time, equilibrium is being established, and then you have a uh, ratio of concentrations, which is uh, dictated by the dissociation constant of direction. But now, uh, let me say that we do not have equilibrium, so that equilibrium is still not established. Uh, then we have the following, uh, the following reaction. Uh, we look how this, uh, this complex changes with time, and it changes in two ways. Uh, so first, first of all, you will have this reversible reaction. It will be this rate of Kf, K off. And this reversible reaction will be proportional to the concentration of your complex. And then you have also the forward rate. So the forward rate is bimolecular reaction. Now take note. So it will be product of the two concentrations, a product of ligand concentration and the receptor concentration. And now, uh, so... Uh, and this is kinetics, and now how we go to equilibrium. So this is another important point. Uh, when you have your kinetics of your reactions written, there is a very simple way to go to equilibrium. You just put your derivatives to zero. So if we take derivative here to be zero, we get this simple al algebraic equation. And then if you rearrange it, we see that uh, this product of concentrations on the left side divided by the complex concentrations corresponds to the ratio of the off and on rate of the reaction. And this is actually our dissociation constant. So here from the kinetics, we also uh, got what our dissociation constant is actually. Okay. Uh, so is there any questions up to now? And I'll just, just, I mean, stop me at any point, man. Okay. Uh, okay, now... Uh, I have told you about this conservation loss, which can make our life simpler. And actually, another thing which can make our, uh, our uh, life simpler is so-called so quasi-equilibrium approximation. Well, people actually call it differently, uh, and it's essentially the same thing. Quasi-equilibrium approximation, rapid equilibrium ex uh, approximation, however. But the point is the following. So let me say that we have a reaction like this. So uh, you see A goes to B with rate K plus. B goes to A with rate K minus. So this is a reversible reaction. But then we also have B going back to C with, uh, not going back, but going to C with rate R. R. So this, this reaction is irreversible. So now tell me, this entire reaction, uh, can it be in equilibrium at all? No, and why not? Exactly. So we, we always have a leak, right? So B will always leak to C, so it will never be in equilibrium. But now, now assume what happens is, let me say that this K plus and K minus are much larger than R. So uh, these on and off rates basically are much larger than this irreversible reaction here. What will happen then is uh, shown on this slide here. So we'll have a very brief transition period. So A will drop briefly, and then B will increase briefly. But after very brief time, what will happen is that ratio of B to A will correspond to a K plus or a K minus ratio. That is, it will correspond to the dissociation constant for this reaction. So it means, uh, yes, for some time you will have kinetics present, you'll be out of equilibrium, but then uh, very soon you will, you will reach your stationary state. Uh, and this is called quasi-equilibrium approximation. So if, if you have Although your entire set of approximation, approximations uh, may not be in equilibrium, if you have one part of your reactions uh, where the reaction rates are fast compared to the other reaction rates in your system, this part of the reactions, uh, you can treat it as being in the equilibrium. So basically you can find, you can write equation like this. And then again, this is convenient because instead of having differential equations, so we again have algebraic expression. And algebraic expression is, of course, much more simpler than uh, having differential equation. OK. So uh, was this clear? Is there any questions about? OK. And actually, uh, one nice example of uh, rapid, uh, of, uh, of quasi-equilibrium approximation 
is Michaelis Menten law itself. So uh, for those of you who are, and actually physicists probably as well, uh, heard for Michaelis Menten, but especially chemists, bioengineers, biologists, and so on. Uh, so Michaelis Menten law, uh, it is giving you uh, the rate of the reaction when it is catalyzed by enzyme. So what happens is that uh, we have enzyme which is being bound to substrate, and then there are two reaction rates, the forward reaction rates and the reverse re reaction rate, and then what happens is that uh, we have a complex of enzyme to substrate, and then enzyme will dissociate, and we will have a product. Now, uh, there are several ways, actually, uh, to derive the michaelis menten law, but in our context, we will use this rapid equilibrium approximation. So uh, the assumption here is that this binding of enzyme to substrate happens much faster than this reversible reaction of, uh, of getting the product, this R. And then uh, when this happens, so we can treat this part of the reaction as being in the equilibrium. And if this part is, of the reaction is being in the equilibrium, then uh, the amount of this complex will be given by this sigmoidal curve. And this is why I was reviewing it in the beginning of the lecture. So this is a, just our sigmoidal curve. Instead of dissociation constant, we have here michaelis menten constant. But, it, but its interpretation of the michaelis menten constant is that it is exactly uh, the dissociation constant for binding the enzyme to the substrate. Uh, Okay, and, and here you have the plot. So again, it's, it's nonlinear curve. And, and this was the question that, that was asked in the beginning. So uh, indeed, if you, if you have the K uh, of the protein, which is being catalyzed by an enzyme, it will not be, uh, it will not be a linear dependence. It will be nonlinear, as you can see here. However, in a special case, imagine that uh, this substrate is, concentration of the substrate is much smaller than the michaelis menten constant. Uh, then what happens is that uh, this relationship becomes linear because this is much smaller than one. And then indeed you have, you have uh, the rate of processing which is directly proportional to the, to the substrate uh, concentration. Okay. Uh, and by the way, uh, one more thing. Uh, it's really very useful to know your numbers in the problem. So... Uh, the orders of magnitude are the following. So this michaelis menten constant, it is typically uh, in the micromolar or millimolar molar range. So the chemists and biologists will know what is millimolar. And for physicists, so uh, can, can, some, can someone tell me simply, uh, for example, concentration of one nanomolar, what it corresponds to, say, in bacterial cell? How many molecules in bacterial cell will be one nanomolar? Exactly, about one molecule per cell is one nanomolar. So essentially, if you have, for example, 10 or something like that molecules per year cell, this will be a concentration of 10 nanomolars. And typical michaelis menten constants are on micromolar or millimolar range. Then indeed, you know, this you can neglect with respect to this one. And then indeed, you will have this, uh, you will have this linear dependence. But in other cases, if your substrate concentrations are higher, then you, you have to use the entire nonlinear equation. Okay. Uh, now, I will give you two examples. Uh, so uh, these are sort of basic reactions which, which allow you to, if you have your system of reactions, to write your differential equations. Now, uh, let me see some examples. Uh, the first example is crisp transcript processing. So uh, up to now, I was telling you uh, that nonlinearity is really very important, but actually this is the problem where you can realistically approximate your system by being linear. And this is why I'm, I'm starting from this. So it is a piece of our research actually presented in a very simplified manner. But it's, I think, very good for teaching. Uh, so uh, first of all, I should tell you about CRISPR-Cas. So you might have heard about CRISPR-Cas in the context of biotechnology. So this is this thing which is uh, allowing you to, in principle, edit uh, any part of your genome sequence, uh, uh, okay, and, uh, but also, importantly, it is immune system in the bacteria. So it is defending your bacteria against uh, foreign DNA, such as viruses, plasmids, and so on. And actually, people first understood this, uh, this system in bacteria, and then it was translated essentially directly to biotechnology applications. Okay, uh, 
So in one word, uh, CRISPR-Cas is an advanced bacterial Im immune system, which is based on expression of small RNA molecules. I will explain this in the moment. And actually, in the context of this school, uh, it is interesting to note that this is really an example of this new research cycle in biology. This system, its function, it was theoretically predicted first, and then only subsequently it was uh, it was uh, experimentally confirmed. It was actually bioinformatically predicted by Conin and Makarova from NIH. And it was not only, how to say, bioinformatic result, it was also a specific model which was behind that. And it worked. So uh, what they predicted really turned out to be the function of this system that is, it's, it's indeed bacterial immune system. Uh, okay, so uh, here is shown CRISPR-Cas. Uh, so CRISPR-Cas stands for two things. So uh, one is crispr array. So crispr array is shown here. So crispr array uh, consists of repeat spacers, repeat spacers, repeat spacers, repeat spacers, and so on. Uh, now, uh, these spacers are interesting because they are complementary to the part of the virus sequence. So we have virus, which is coming in the bacteria, and then spacer will be complementary to the part of the virus sequence. So this, this will allow for the system to recognize the virus. Once it recognizes the virus, uh, the target that is the virus will be destroyed. I, I will briefly explain how this happens. But this is why we have spacers here. And then another component are Cas proteins. So uh, Cas means CRISPR-associated proteins. So they come together with CRISPR. And uh, these Cas proteins, uh, for our purposes, they have uh, two functions. So the first function is the following. So uh, this CRISPR array, so this array, it will be transcribed as one long transcript. And then you need to, to cut this long transcript essentially into these individual spacers, which, will be, which are called CRISPR RNAs, uh, CRRNAs. And this is being done by Cas proteins. So we have pre-CRRNA. This is this long transcript. And then this, it's being processed to small RNA molecules, which are called CRRNAs by Cas. And now what happens is that once we have CRRNAs, so CRRNA will be complementary to the part of virus sequence. And then what will happen is that Cas proteins will be recruited and then they will destroy the target. So Cas proteins actually have two important functions. They're processing this long transcript to small RNA molecules, to CRRNAs. And then secondly, once the target is recognized, they will be recruited to the target and destroy the target. And in this way, the cell is being defended from viruses. OK. Uh, and now, as you, as you can imagine from this, very important part is this transcript processing. This is how we, how you, how we get uh, CRRNAs from this long pre-CRRNA. And now, uh, on this problem, we were working with our experimental collaborators, and they had a uh, somewhat surprising observation. Uh, what they have seen is that so uh, if they overexpress their Cas genes, and ju just to remind you, so Cas genes are this thing which are processing, which are cutting the pre-CRRNA uh, to small RNA molecules. So if they do that, then pre-CRRNA will decrease uh, by a factor which is less than 10. But then on the other hand, if they look for CRRNA, they will get more than two orders of magnitude increase of CRRNA. So what happens is that uh, very, very modest decrease in pre-CRRNA leads to a much larger, more than two orders of magnitude larger increase of CRRNA. That is, you decrease your substrate only for small amount, and you get very large amount of product. It almost looks like that you get, you know, uh, much from nothing, not really nothing, but, but from small things. And then uh, they were wondering how, how this is possible, and, and I should tell you two more things. So what happens with the CRRNA is that the CRRNA are actually very stable in the cell. Uh, on the other hand, pre-CRRNA, uh, they are very unstable. I'm sorry, there is a mistake here. It should be very unstable. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this small stability is not consequence of pre-CRRNA being processed to CRRNA, but it is actually consequence of their nonspecific degradation. So pre-CRRNA is, is nonspecifically degraded very fast inside the cell. So uh, when you have a thing like, like this, uh, a reasonable starting point is to make a minimal model. So minimal model means that you make a model of, of just what is directly ob observed in the experiment. So what is observed here? So first we have pre-CRRNA. It is transcribed. It has to be generated. 
then two, thi two, two things can, can happen. You have this fast non-specific degradation. And then secondly, you can have processing by Cas proteins. Uh, and then by this processing, you get CRRNA. And CRRNA is being degraded, but it's very stable. So its degradation rate it must, is much smaller than the degradation rate of pre-CRRNA. And now, uh, actually, uh, I will leave this entire thing for your exercise. This will be the problem in the end of the lecture. So what I, what I want you to do in the lecture is uh, that you write differential equations which corresponds to this set of essentially biochemical reactions. So uh, one thing that I would point, point out is that uh, uh, these concentrations of pre-CRRNA, they are small in the cell. So experiment tells us that it is uh, on the order of 10 or smaller. So if it is like that, uh, and, and, and right, so uh, this processing of CRRNA to pre-CRNA, it is being catalyzed by Cas proteins. So in principle, uh, we should use what law here to describe how we get CRRNA proof from pre-CRRNA? I showed you before. So you have a reaction which is catalyzed by enzyme. Enzyme is Cas here, Cas proteins. So we should use what? Well, it's michaelis menten law, right? Whenever we have enzyme involved, it's michaelis menten law. But because I told you that these concentrations of pre-CRRNA are small, we can just make this relationship linear. In other words, we can, we can say that the rate of generation of CRRNA is just directly proportional to the concentration of pre-CRRNA. Because concentrations are like on the order of 10 nanomolars or less, and typical michaelis menten constants are micromolar or millimolar range. Okay, and now uh, what you should derive in this problem is this relationship. By the way, uh, so you write your differential equations, then you assume equilibrium. So remember, when things are in equilibrium, you just put your derivatives to zero. And then after some manipulation, you will be able to derive this, this simple relationship. Uh, what this relationship is uh, relating is a uh, decrease in the amount of pre-CRRNA and increase in the amount of CRRNA, CRRNA. So delta here is, is the change. And importantly, there is a pre-factor here. And this pre-factor is actually a ratio of the degradation rate of pre-CRRNA to the degradation rate of CRRNA. So here you see that actually your system corresponds to strong linear amplification of transcripts. Why it's linear? Because there is a linear relationship between the decrease of pre-CRRNA and the increase of CRRNA. But then this pre-factor, it gets very important because this rate, uh, this rate is very large and this rate is small. So this pre-factor is large. So then if you have a small decrease of your pre-CRNA RNA, you will get very large increase of your CRRNA. And then this simple relationship, it's exactly explaining what is being observed in the, in the experiment. That is that you have small decrease in the substrate, and by this you get very large increase of the product. Okay, and what is even more interesting is that this strong amplification actually crucially depends on uh, fast non-specific degradation. So it's something non-specifically uh, which is being done in the system which actually allows for, for this effect. Okay. Uh, okay, do, do you have any questions? Up to now. Okay. Uh, now uh, you you can also. Uh huh. Yes. Can yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Why, why is the answer turned on? Uh huh. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is very good, good question. Why is it then and turned on? Uh, can I, can you, I will explain it in a few slides. So you'll see the actual mechanism, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I should say, so uh, there are two questions. So uh, naturally, I'll explain how it is properly turned on. But in the experiments that you see, it is artificially overexpressed. So they turn on the system by, by artificially expressing this enzyme into the cell. So these are these experiments specifically that I showed you. But in the actual bacteria, this process is regulated, and I will explain this in, in a few slides. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, now, this this was equilibrium, right? And and then you can also uh, you can also. Okay. 
so uh, you can also uh, simulate uh, the dynamics of this process. So uh, what you see, so this k is uh, the rate of processing of the enzyme, and then what we see is uh, if you increase the k, what will happen is pre-CR RNA will, will drop down for order for, for factor of, of let's, let's say about 10. Uh, now, uh, what we also see is that CRRNA will increase, and it will increase much more for about two so, orders of magnitude. But now, uh, let, let me say that, that we uh, keep increasing this, uh, this processing rate. Uh, that is, uh, we, creep, we keep adding more and more Cas proteins. What will actually happen is the saturation in CRRNA amounts. And then the saturation is, uh, uh, what happens is that, uh, basically, uh, as, as this processing rate is increased, you do not have, uh, you do not have uh, further increase in the amount of CRNA. Basically, uh, the, the thing stops to increase. Now, uh, evidently, what you can do, if you want to get more of your CRRNA molecules, what you can do is you can increase uh, the rate of uh, pre-CRRNA degradation. So you can increase the transcription rate of this CRISPR array. And if you do this, and if you do that for uh, biologically reasonable numbers, you can actually get a very large amount of CRRNA be synthesized. So this here shows what happens if we turn on both the enzyme, right? And if we increase uh, the generation rate of uh, pre-CRRNA, uh, you get, uh, uh, you're getting, uh, basically increase of CRRNA, which co corresponds to about three orders of magnitude. So we can get very large production of CRRNA. Uh, now, why this may be important? So uh, how this system actually works in the cell? Uh, so uh, what I told you is that uh, you have uh, two parts. You have Cas proteins, and then you have crispr -E. And what happens is that uh, normally, so when virus does not enter the cell, both Cas proteins, so these are this enzyme, and CRISPR, they're tightly repressed. They're tightly repressed by one global transcription regulator in bacteria, which is called HNS. And now, uh, well, uh, the most prominent model of, of how this system is, is activated is that what happens when virus comes in, this repression of the CRISPR and Cas promoters is being relieved. Uh, this repression by, by by uh, HNS is being relieved, and then what happens is that both Cas genes and CRISPR are being activated, so they're jointly activating. So both the amount of Cas proteins and the transcription rate of CRISPR increases. So then this would correspond to this situation here that we have really very, very fast and very, very large increase of uh, CRRNA in our system. And uh, can you tell me from, from the side of biology, why I think this is important? So virus comes into cell and why it is really essential for the cell to be able to synthesize so many CRRNAs in as short time as possible? Exactly, well, it is a matter of life and death for bacteria actually. So when virus comes, if it is lytic virus, it will just kill bacteria. Not only it, it will kill bacteria, it, it does this uh, very effectively. So what happens is that within minutes, the virus will basically disable the main processes inside the whole cell. It will disable transcription, translation, and so on. And then in about 15 to, minus, to, 15 to, uh, to 20 minutes, the whole cell will be destroyed. It will be lysed. It will burst, essentially. So then it's, it's really, really very essential for the cell to be able to, in a short time, produce as much CRRNA molecules as possible. So then uh, this consideration, uh, this simulation considerations that we have are actually likely directly relevant, uh, directly relevant for the mechanism for how uh, the virus is, uh, um, this crispr cas is defending the cell for the virus. Uh, what I should, however, tell is that uh, the entire mechanism, that is most of the mechanism of how this happens is still unclear. And actually this is one of our active, one, one, one area of research that we are actively working on. In, partic in particular what is not clear is how it exactly happens. So I told you virus comes in and then you relieve this, uh, this, uh, this uh, repression of HNS. So the question is how it happens, you know, how this 
this whole thing is being activated. And again, this is, this is one thing that we are actively working, working on right now. OK, so. Uh, Right, yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, about CRISPR-Cas, so there are different types of CRISPR-Cas. So there are three main types, type 1, type 2, and type 3. So uh, what I was explaining here, so this picture here, it corresponds to type 1. So this is the most prevalent type of bacteria. But it's actually not the most important, uh, not the most important in the cells of biotechnological applications. So in type 1, you have many Cas proteins. And this is why it is, it is, it is complex system. You must make a complex. But then in type 2 systems, you have only one protein. You have only one, one Cas protein. It's called Cas9. And this is why all the biotechnology applications are actually based on type 2 systems. So in type 2 systems, you have only one Cas protein, and you have your small RNA, which is, which is recognizing uh, the target in the complex. And then you have type 3 system, which is more, more convenient, more, 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 uh, well, more characteristic for a hair than for, uh, than for bacteria. Uh, now, uh, the other question, you know, how, how, how this specific mechanism is, is widespread? Uh, well, uh, it happens in one of the subtypes, like this. It happens in one of the subtypes of, uh, of type 1 system. It is called type 1e. So we have it in E. coli, and E. coli is standard model system, experimental model system. And this is the standard model system for regulation. So there we have sort of enough about the mechanism, enough parameters, and so on. So what we are working on in terms of modeling is specifically for one E system. Now, uh, in its essence, it is very likely uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the main parts of the mechanism are, are widespread. This is something that we know from bioinformatics, because as we are building this model, we are also testing bioinformatically if the main assumptions like differences in the AT content between the bacterial genome and virus genome, which happens to be important for the model, also happen in other systems. But really where we have, we are sort of limited where we have very good experiments, and very good experiments are in E. coli in type 1. So, so strictly the model applies to type 1e, but then we hope that the main properties of this model will apply to, 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 to much larger class of systems. So that's in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So biotechnologically, this is one main application. So for example, if you have a monogenetic disease, so I was, I was, thinking, I was talking about sickle cell anemia, so it is only one gene. So then the idea is that uh, you can repair this gene, right, and then basically cure the sickle cell anemia. Of course, you know, uh, there are many controversies related with this, because if you do that, you're making irreversible change uh, in your genome sequence. And, well, uh, making irreversible changes in genome sequences is, is related with different. I mean, it's, it's done routinely in laboratory with mouse, with plants, and so on. But if you want to do it with humans, of course, in medical applications, there will be many bioethical issues related with that. But I would rather not come into that topic, so it's. OK. Uh, OK, so then the conclusion is that the system can uh, generate uh, very large quantities of crRNA very fast. And this, this fast production is based on control of the system of the, the, the level of RNA processing. So uh, on the last lecture, I told you that control does not necessarily have, does not have to happen on the level of transcription initiation. Here we have a nice example where control is exhibited the, at the level of processing of the transcript. And actually also on very careful tuning of the system parameters. So you have these extreme values of the degradation rates of the proteins. And also very surprisingly, uh, it is this unidentified nuclease which is responsible for fast pre-CRNA pre degradation, which is probably the most important control element in the system. So somehow you would think about degradation of, of leading to dissipation in your system, doing something unuseful. But actually here it's a crucial part of the mechanism, which allows to have this very large increase of uh, CRRNA amount. OK. Uh, OK, so now I will also briefly, I have, I think, 10, 15 more minutes to go through oscillatory system. But is there any more questions before? OK. 
Chris Barnier. Chris Barnier. Uh -huh. It was, I'm sorry? Discretized. Discretized. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, so th this was important point that I was trying to make. So you see, uh, these red curves that you see, uh, they correspond to the de deterministic modeling. So this is when you solve your differential equations. And like this thing, uh, this, this noisy vigorous, so what do you think? What are these actually? So you can simulate your system deterministically, or the other way would be what? Stochastic, exactly right. So uh, these are actually stochastic curves. Uh, because uh, imagine you have molecules which react. So it will be a random process. So two molecules meet randomly. So essentially, every time when you start, even if you start from the same initial conditions, your reaction will be different. And these stochastic simulations show you different paths of uh, of reactions uh, that can happen purely by, by random. Uh, now, uh, in this case, we were actually looking at uh, something, uh, something else uh, in this system, how much basically the amount of CRRNA, which is a toxic molecule fluctuates. But actually, uh, what I should uh, take a note is, is to mention two things. So uh, very often you hear this question, when I should do the deterministic simulation, when I should do stochastic simulation, so uh, do you have some idea on what, on what di this depends, actually? So what are the main thing when, when stochastic effects will become? We have few yeah, so when we have few molecules, right? So you can imagine this, you do not even have to work with the molecules. So imagine that you have, that you want to populate island with cats, for example, and then you put one male cat and female cat on your island, right? They will replicate. And then if you take it uh, deterministically, after n replication, you will have how, how many cats? Deterministically. Two to the power of n, right? So with every replication, you in principle get two, two cats. But then imagine you have male cat and female cat, and then, for example, male cat dies. After n replications, how many cats you will have? Well, it will be zero, right? Because, you know, the, the female cat dies, so the male cat can you're to keep produce. So this is the main point, right? So uh, when you have just two cats, random processes become very important. For example, you know, one cat has died, so this is the random process. And then you go from exponential number of cats that you have after some time to zero cats, basically, in the, sto in the stochastic modeling. So uh, this is like simple no argument that when you have low number of molecules, then your stochastic effects, your stochastic modeling is important. And the other way around, where you have many molecules, it typically is, uh, is not that important. Okay, uh, uh, so this is one widely recognized thing. So people usually say if you have less than 10 molecules, then you should do stochastic modeling. If you have more, then you should, uh, you should not, uh, or, or you, you do not have to. But actually, the other important factor is, again, nonlinearity. So uh, you see here, for example, this is linear system. And if you look, if you take mean of these stochastic trajectories, you will basically get the deterministic trajectory. And this is actually exact result. For linear system, mean of your st stochastic trajectories will exactly correspond to the deterministic traje trajectory. However, if you have nonlinear system, it will not be like that. So uh, even if you take, if you, even if you neglect fluctuations, the mean of your stochastic trajectories can have very different result than the deterministic model. The system can stochastically behave in principle much differently than, than your deterministic simulation. So again, nonlinearity is also something which it should take into account. Okay. Okay, and now uh, we are at the oscillatory system. So uh, many processes in the cell oscillate. Uh, so uh, I will cover two important examples. So one I already mentioned, circadian rhythms. Basically, when you have change of uh, night and day, there is something in your body which should tell you how to adjust the temperature, when you feel sleepy, when you feel hungry, and so on. And these are circadian clocks. And the other actually oscillator in the cell is cell cycle itself. So cell cycle takes note when to divide your cell. So after periodic time, your cell should divide, and this is another very nice example of an oscillator uh, in cell. 
Okay, now, uh, what I should say is that biological oscillators are typically complex, and actually, if you go to the working session on Friday, we will devote the entire working session to, to that. But actually, there's so much important, in my opinion, that uh, I thought I should also tell you basics in this lecture. So these basics will be essentially without any math, just qualitatively, and then if you're interested in math, you can come on, on Friday. Okay. Uh, now, first of all, what I should clarify. Uh, so if you have cell, right? Uh, you know, at introductory physics, uh, we are taught to think about oscillations as having a spring and as having a mass. So you pull out, you know, your mass out to the equilibrium position, and then the things will oscillate. So these are mechanical oscillations. Now, something like this, you do not see in the cell. And the reason is because cell is essentially water. It's very large viscosity. So what will happen is, if we do this in the water, what do you think will happen with this mass? Will it go back and forth? Will it oscillate or something else? Well, it will make what is known as overdumped oscillations, right? So you will release it, and it will just very slowly, and actually Ralph was also telling about this, so it will very slowly just, just go to the equilibrium position. So uh, we basically, inside the cell, we do not see mechanistic oscillations. But then we see another type of oscillations, and it's another type of oscillation is, is based on biochemical reactions. And typical, the most well-known motive, although it's not the only way that you can have oscillations in your cell, is the following simple motive. So you have your activator and you have your repressor. And then your activator is activating itself. So there is positive feedback loop, loop here. And the repressor is, as you can imagine, it's repressing the activator. So now how these oscillations work? So first you have activator, which is, which is being increased because of this positive feedback loop. But then as activator is increasing, repressor will increase as well. And then when the repressor sufficiently increases, it will drop down the concentration of activator. So activator will go up first, then it will go down, okay? But then if activator goes down, then again, there will be no more repressor, so this repression will be relieved, which means that activator can go up again, it then goes down, up and down, and so on. So this is the most simple motif which is making oscillation in the cell, and this is very frequently used in biological circuits. Uh, I should mention one more thing. So it is not that simple. It's, it's not really possible just to make any activator, any repressor, to make activation and repression. It will not oscillate. What is again crucial is this cooperativity that I'm repeating all the time. So this process is this binding of repressor to activator. In particular, it has to be highly cooperative. And it has to be highly cooperative because of this switch-like behavior that I was telling you about. So we have increase of your activator that at some point you should, it should crash rapidly, right? And it crashes rapidly if you have this switch-like behavior, large cooperativity. Then it will go back to zero and then it will continue to oscillate and so on. And uh, intuitively, it's very hard to say in advance when your system will oscillate and when not. So this is why basically nonlinear systems are hard to, in principle, uh, to say what their behavior will be uh, intuitively. Uh, and this is where nonlinear dynamics actually, actually comes. And this is why on, on the working session today, we will, we will cover bifurcations and uh, things like that. So it, it's... Most frequently what happens is in this oscillator, if you, if you heard for hop bifurcation, so we have stationary state which is initially stable, and then you, you lose stability of this stationary state, and then as you lose stability of your stationary state, the system has nowhere to go, and then it has to oscillate. So, okay, so uh, this is the most frequent member. But again, we, we'll come back in ma mathematical, more mathematical details will come on Friday. Okay, uh, and here is one, one very nice example of this mechanism. So you have cycling, uh, which is activator, and then you have cycling dependent kinase, which is repressor. So you see cycling is increasing initially, but then uh, this, uh, this cycling dependent kinase repressor, uh, it starts to increase as well. And at, once, at one point, this repressor will increase so much that it will rapidly drop down the activator. And again, you can see how cooperative this is, you know, how, how, how sort of sharp this transition here is. So uh, it will drop the activator down, then it will go up again, down, up, and so on. 
And then this one cycle of oscillation is basically measuring the cell division time. It's telling the cell when to divide. OK, and now circadian oscillators. So this is very ni one very nice example of a circadian oscillator. So this spider is a very good night hunter. What it does, it makes, makes a web. Uh, but since it is night hunter, it, has to, it, has to, it must have very good night vision. And what happens is that between day and night, you can see that uh, the structure of the photoreceptor cells, it gets very drastically changed. You know, from this structure to this more elaborate structure. And actually, if you look uh, on the electron microscope, uh, your photoreceptor cell, you will see that during the night, there is a very drastic uh, thickening of this cell membrane. So there are very large structural change which is happening. And uh, very interestingly and fascinatingly, this happens just during the day and the night. So this is day, this is night, then by the day it goes back here and so on. So it oscillates really. The entire elaborate structure is oscillating between day and night. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, so if you sort of summarize it, so we have one simple conceptual model, right? Activator, which is activating repressor, and repressor, which is repressing the activator. And then we have seen two very different, mechanistically very different implementations of this, uh, of this type, type of control. One is circadian glutams. And by the way, uh, this, these genes, they have very interesting names. So for example, uh, activator is, is called clock and uh, the repressor is called period. And it goes back to the very beginning of the molecular biology. They were doing these mutations, in flies in particular, and then they were seeing if I mutate this gene, then circadian rhythm in, in, in my fly will, 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 will be affected, right? And then that, that's why they called the gene uh, clock. And then evidently they do another mutant then period, all right, uh, in the circadian oscillatory changes. So they called it period. And, and uh, there are alternative names, actually, also. This is, uh, this is cycle, and this is timeless, and so on. So these names itself are very suggestive and very interesting, I think. OK, uh, so uh, what I wanted to emphasize, this is actually one of the major goals of systems biology. So we have simple conceptual model. And uh, this conceptual model can then, in principle, explain mechanistically very different systems. And this is one of the main goals of systems biology. Uh, to actually understand, understand uh, common design principles behind mechanistically otherwise very different biological systems. And uh, just to get the feeling of how oscillators are important, so uh, Nobel Prize in 2017 for Physiology and Medicine, it was awarded to Hall, Rosbach, and Young, three scientists from Brandis. Uh, and uh, this was actually for their work on understanding molecular mechanisms between, uh, behind circadian oscillators. And actually, if you like controversy in the science, you can Google a little bit about this Nobel Prize because there was a fourth scientist, United States scientist of Czech, Czech origin, Konopka. And many people think that he is, well, very much, well, he was also very much entitled to get the Nobel Prize. But again, I mean, you can, you can read if you're interested about that and, and make your own opinion. So, uh, OK, in any case, OK. Uh, now, uh, I should, I think I have five more minutes, is it? OK, yeah. So uh, and I'll finish earlier. So I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, so uh, what we looked here is, uh, is, this, uh, is this type of oscillator where we have positive and negative feedback loops. And uh, this is often called the relaxation oscillator. And I will not come, come into this now. Uh, uh, it will be on the working session why it's called relaxation uh, oscillator. Uh, but now, in addition, I just wanted to mention that uh, things are not, not, not that simple. That is, this is not the only mechanism that can make oscillations in the cell. There is even a uh, more simple mechanism. And this more simple mechanism is uh, what is known as the, de the delay oscillator. So what happens in the delay oscillator is you have just one gene, and it is repressing itself. But it is repressing itself with a delay. So imagine you have a gene, so concentration of these genes is increasing, it's increasing, and this repression comes with a delay. And if it is also highly cooperative, then what will happen is that at some point, you know, this repression will drop down uh, the amount of the gene, right? But then the repression itself will be relieved, then the gene can go up as 
again, and then again it will crash, go up, and so on. And so this is so-called uh, delay oscillator. Uh, and uh, well, uh, this simple system that they, that they describes that they described. So just one gene repressing itself in order to work, it needs really very large cooperity. This Hill constant, it has to be as, as large as eight. So you know in hemoglobin there, are, there is four, and here it is repressed, so you must have eight, say eight monomers in order for this thing to work. But now there, are, of course, this is in the most simple implementation. This is one famous implementation of the delay oscillator. It is synthetic biology implementation. It's not a natural gene circuit, but circuit which was artificially made in the laboratory. It was uh, made by uh, Stan Leibler and, and, and Elowitz uh, at Rockefeller. And uh, basically this thing uh, together with toggle switch, uh, I will just briefly mention in the literature toggle switch as well, uh, it initiated a so-called era of synthetic biology. It showed that synthetically inside the cell you can artificially connect the genes and make things which do something useful. For example, oscillate or they have a switch-like behavior. They, they have two, two stable states. There be stable systems and so on. Okay, but just briefly, so here in this repressilator, the way this delay works is that you have, instead of just one, you have three genes. And uh, essentially, these three genes are repressing each other. So three repressions are like three minuses. So if you multiply them, you get one minus. So essentially, if you get back to this gene one, you will have repression, but repression with much of a delay because this will go to, to other genes. And now in this system you need significantly lower cooperativity uh, in order to work. Okay, uh, now, now literature, and I will finish with this. Uh, so the general literature, it remains the same as I, as I told you last time. So uh, you can look at, at our paper about this crisp transcript processing. So it's very simple mechanism, so therefore it's, it's I think, very, it can be used uh, nicely, I think, in, in, in lectures, in ed education. And actually, uh, uh, this other paper, I just wanted to point out, when you find out how something works in the nature, you can also propose synthetic way in order for the same thing to work. Uh, and here, we, what we did is actually proposed uh, one simple uh, synthetic pathway where, where you can get a large amount of, uh, large amount of product for a small amount of substrate that it says toxic. Toxic meaning it, it has to be kept at small levels. Okay, now about biological oscillators. So it will be more this working session, but if you do not go to the working session, uh, you may need this in the future. So I just wanted to point you to what are, in my opinion, really the most important historic references. So I was mentioning the repressilator. So it sort of, as I said, started the era of synthetic biology. It was made by Elowitz and Leibler. So you, you can see this nature paper. Uh, it's easy to read and short to read, so I think if you have time, you should, you should read it. Uh, then uh, this other relaxation oscillator. So this is this activator and repressor, the mechanism which I was explaining uh, most of the time. Uh, it was actually synthetically, uh, it was, uh, synthetically implemented by Husty and co-workers. So this is this nature paper. And actually before uh, this synthetic implementation, uh, they developed a theory at least approximate theory behind this oscillator. Uh, and this is in, in this PRL paper. Uh, and in any case, when they implemented it experimentally, what they found out is that they need more elaborate model. But I will not come into that. You can, you can actually read the papers. And uh, I was not covering uh, B-stable switches, B-stability bifurcations at all in the basic lecture. So it will be today in the, in the afternoon, in the working session. But just in the case, again, you do not come to the working session and if you need it at, at some point in, in, in your time. So the really most important paper uh, to read is this Collins paper by Collins and co co-workers. Uh, so uh, this Collins switch, so this is, again, synthetic B-stable switch in bacteria, together with this repressilator by Elowitz and Leibler, it started the era of synthetic biology. Here they made B-stable switch in bacteria, and here they made oscillator in the bacteria, and about at the same time. Uh, so uh, you may want to look at these papers as well. Uh, and actually, uh, os oscillators, I'm sorry, B-stable switches are quite nicely explained in this English uh, book as well. Uh, and actually, even better, so the essential ideas are perhaps even more 
clearly explained in this standard nonlinear non dynamics text. It's not dealing with genes itself, it's dealing with other examples, but it's really very easy sort of to translate to, uh, to gene systems. So, uh, in fact, what most often happens here is saddle node bifurcation, and uh, well, this is, uh, and there are very nice examples of that which can be directly translated to, uh, to these stable switches. Okay, uh, and now the problem. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll not read the entire problem. So it's, it's based on, the, on this example of pre-CRNA processing. So essentially what I would like you to do is to derive this equation. So you need just paper and pencil, nothing else to get it, but you should be a little bit patient with manipulations. Uh, so this you do in equilibrium. And then uh, you can also try to simulate your system. So here are the parameters in order to reproduce, deterministically, of course. You don't have to, I mean, if you want, you can do it stochastically as well, but. Uh, so uh, try to reproduce this thing, basically. Okay, so you can use any software that you want, you know, that, that, is, that can solve differential equations. MATLAB, Octave, Python, R, I guess, can do that, whatever, you know. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's, if you have questions. <laughs> I guess there was enough questions during lectures. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so was it, was it over time actually? Yeah. I think, was it fine with time more or less? Yeah, that's fine because you started late. Yeah, yeah okay. So good morning, everybody. Sorry to, to I mean, waste a little bit of the breakfast time, but just to, uh, the break time. So uh, we had the problems with the, the working group sections that I think people got confused. So we are trying again, and instead of having the list to circulate with you the paper where we have it signed, we have it placed in this table over there. Everything 